Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to our segment, which we call our Gallery 51 Featured Artist. And we have the pleasure of yet another visit with uh, Vincent Valdez. And this time we get to talk with just him. So I'd like to welcome Vincent Valdez to um, Gallery 51's Featured Artist segment. Thanks so much for being here. It's my pleasure. It's good to see you all on a Saturday. Yes. Um, you know, I think as we shared your work and we've had you talk with our students uh, in relationship to Hostile Terrain and people see your work on our social media, so many folks are excited and have comments about your work. And um, for those that didn't have an opportunity to join us, we even had a discussion, a visual thinking strategies discussion on um, one of your pieces that was amazing. And it was so incredible to have you there with us. I don't think you really understood the impact um, after we kind of debriefed as a group again. Everybody just felt so, um, I, I can't put it any other way, but so honored and privileged to have had you there to talk about the work and tell us the backstory. So I just, I thank you again for coming back with us and, and letting us listen to how this all started and what your journey has been like. Um, I'll say that one of the reasons parency and not necessarily the roadmap, but a possible roadmap for navigating a career in the arts. Um, and for all of us, that looks very different. And this particular project that we're dealing with, a lot of the focus that we have is how artists who come from historically underrepresented groups focus on this journey but navigate it differently and what some of those paths are like so that we can be informed and then know what we don't know. So you are an exemplar for that and I and I so I'm looking forward I think as all of us are to hear about your um, your journey and where you are and um, we'll probably be asking questions uh, through this about what is happening in your studio right now as we see um, someone working on a piece behind you. But I'm gonna start first as I always do, where are you call, Where are you talking to us from? I am coming live from New Haven, Connecticut uh, at the Next Haven Fellowship Program. Uh, I have been, I arrived in New Haven, Connecticut in January, right at the peak of winter, straight from Houston, Texas. Uh, really took me a little while to get adjusted. Uh, I hadn't been up in the Northeast region as far as livings uh, for 20 years since my days at, at the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, I, uh, and so I'm, I'm very excited to be a part of this program. What Next, Next Haven is, is still in its infancy. This is year two, so I am class two. Um, they are, there are uh, six artists from around the country, uh, one international, two curatorial fellows. Now, the thing that makes Next Haven um, pretty specifically peculiar, I think, um, you know, very different from most pro art programs that are offered, being offered around the country at this moment, is that this is a program that is geared more towards artists of color, brown and, uh, from the brown and black arts community. Um, and uh, I, I applied to this program uh, in fall of last year. Uh, the fellowship itself lasts an entire year, uh, provides each artist with an amazing studio. The building in itself is, is pretty epic. Um, it's an old, I think, uh, an old 1920s factory that was, uh, that was making scientific glass beakers. And so they're perfect for artist spaces, high ceilings, beautiful lighting, solid floors. Um, and, uh, and what a community uh, that uh, is being developed here. It's right in the heart of the Dixwell uh, community, which is a historic uh, black community in the heart of New Haven. Um, and it's just a, a really amazing support group that I've found amongst my fellow artists. You know, I'm really um, having a, an amazing time um, exchanging ideas, resources, information, and um, camaraderie with my, with my artist fellows. I am, for one of the first times in my lifetime and career, I am officially the oldest artist on the roster here. Um, you know, I started so early in life uh, that I had the privilege 
of, for about 25 years of always being the youngest one in any exhibition in any room. And this is one of the very first years where I'm being told, oh, you know, you're like the Yoda of the group, you know? And so <laughs> it's really funny because uh, the first time that this happened to me, caught me off guard was also this year, my gallerist in Los Angeles said, you know, all the artists in the roster really look up to you because uh, you're like the Magic Johnson of the team. <laughs> And I said, Magic Johnson, I'm more like Kobe. He's like, no, 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 these guys are Kobe. You're Magic. I was like, man, I'm not retired yet. Like, at least make me LeBron. <laughs> Come on. So I really had to sit and reflect for about three days in the corner. <laughs> like, what does this all mean? <laughs> I'm not ready yet. But, uh, but I'm having a great time up here. It, it's been a, an, a, an amazingly productive and challenging year for myself and for many of us as we know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it, it that is a it is a harsh realization, although it definitely is a, a tribute to you. But yeah, getting over it's like when your favorite songs are now on the classic rock station, you're not quite understanding how that happened. Yeah. And to, I didn't know it had been that long since you'd been on the East Coast. Yeah, and so it's really amazing to come back and um, see the ways that not only the uh, the region has changed, but more more importantly, to see the ways that I, I uh, my perception of this part of the country, right? Um, now with a, um, uh, a load of experience that I can bring from the places and the things that I've been able to be witness to over the past 20 years and, and bring these stories, um, this sort of um, uh, bag of resources back here and share it with communities up here, I think for me are most important. Um, I, uh, you know, it's, it's an important thing for me to be able to be at this stage in, in life and, and in career, uh, making the work that I'm trying to make um, and, and be, to be doing it in this region, I think really in many ways um, through osmosis starts to feed into the work and into the subject matter and into the, my own approach about the way that I view this work and this, these subjects. Right. Um, one, of the, one of the main, um, we talked a little bit before we started this, one of the amazing, I guess, parts of the residency that you're in is the concept of truly paying it forward and nurturing and fostering those that are coming up. And so I'm sure uh, those that watch this are going to wonder who this person in the back is and how that, how that works. Will you, will you share a little bit more about the residency and your, your assistant? Absolutely. So one of the strong components about the Next Haven program is that I uh, that each of the artists um, that are accepted here into the program are are um, expected to work with a young uh, apprentice, um, and so that can that can be approached in, in several ways. For me, it was an immediate um, opportunity to be able to work with a young creative. Uh, mind, right? And so behind me is 16-year-old um, Caitlin, uh, who is a, a local to the region up here. She's a tremendous painter already at 16. I've been working with Caitlin since uh, January. Uh, missed uh, maybe about two or three months because, due to COVID, uh, and then we resumed this past uh, summer. Um, but, you know, for me, it's such, a, such an important part part of the development of a young um, creative mind. I, I come from, my own experience extends from a very um, similar uh, working relationship to Alex Rubio, who was a young muralist um, in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I met Alex when I was nine years old. He was 19 years old. And, um, and he took me under his wing. Uh, I became his uh, little sidekick um, as mural partners. but that really was my first education. I mean, this tremendously powerful moment in my young life um, really shaped the way that I perceived the rest of the world, the way that I perceived my own future 
as an artist, um, as a citizen, as a human being. Um, and I'm, I'm still like brothers with Alex. We're best friends to this day. But I, I never forgot the impact uh, of an older artist always turning around to hand back that torch right, to the next generation saying, I mean, because this is so, mu so much about making art is continuing this legacy. You know, there's a, a great responsibility that comes with um, being an artist. Yes. Um, you know, I, I always viewed it as this was, I, I am entirely, entirely committed to the lineage that has come before me, the legacy of drawing and painting, right? There are, it's an, a, a tremendously um, giant pair of shoes to fill. And so I always knew early on that I was going to devote my entire life and effort to, um, to paying respect to, to those who have, have really devoted their lives, committed their lives to speaking, standing up and speaking up through the power of images. And so for me, I've always made it a point to try and work in any way that I can. Spark that I can recognize as my own when I was that age, right? And so it's not for everybody. It's not a lifestyle for, for everyone, right? And so I'm so proud of, um, Caitlin behind me because she has the, she has the will, she has the commitment. And there's even hours in the studio in complete silence, just working on opposite ends of the, of the room. Um, and uh, there's moments where uh, I want to stop and take a break and, and young Caitlin is still going, you know, and, uh, and so I, I really recognize, I remember what that life, that hunger was like. That's a very important, uh, it's a very important tool to have that can't really be taught by anyone. You just, it's that intuition, that instinct, that, 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 it's that hunger, that, that fire burning in the pit of your stomach that, uh, you know, very, very few uh, people ever have the, uh, the, the great fortune of, of experiencing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I love, I love that you segued into how this all started for you at the at the ripe age of nine and the idea of having found a mentor um was that was it something that you had you already known that art was your passion or your thing or your interest and then it came together or was it do you think that a lot of it um kind of alex was able to to pull out of you or was it just kind of serendipity? How did, how did that work for you? I'm curious. I, uh, I was um, extremely fortunate enough to know that very, very early on that I just, this was something that I wanted to do, something that I was so curious and interested about, you know, and so my parents tell me that I was drawing as early as about um, three or four years old, just obsessively, that there was something different. You know, for me, it was, um, I was such a, an introverted, shy child, you know, maybe it was the middle child syndrome that I was drawing before I was speaking, right? And so this was my way of communicating to others. Um, you know, what I couldn't say verbally, uh, vocally, I could say through images. And, uh, but it was so natural and easy for me that I just thought, well, everybody must know how to draw because it's this easy for me. And so, as early as kindergarten, you know, I still remember glimpses of sitting at the little desk and drawing, uh, looking to the left and the right and seeing my peers um, stick figures and then they'd look at mine and I was drawing with a human body with actual shapes. There was a nose and ears and fingernails. And, <laughs> and so, and then I realized by uh, very quickly by first, second grade that I could start selling these things for a course, <laughs> for just, you know, a lunch snack. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, but, you know, really, I think it really was in my DNA. I, my great grandfather was a painter that I never met, but um, I knew, but I knew him through only through his canvases that graced the walls of my grandparents' house that are still hanging in there to this day. I was just obsessed with these things. I, I, I didn't understand how somebody could make this. I didn't understand what they meant in terms of their imagery. But there was just some kind of resonance. There was a calling. They just, they were like a black hole that just pulled me in. Every time that I walked into that little crooked house and while all my cousins were outside playing and running around, I would sit in these dark hallways and stare at these 
dark, haunting, violent images of the crucifixion of La Virgen de Guadalupe, um, these old eerie landscapes of old Spain, how he remembered it, of old Mexico. Um, and I was just obsessed. I studied them. It was my first museum experience in a way. And I would just, I would get so frustrated. I would sit there with a, my notebook paper and a pen and I would try to make them look just like his. And I would get so angry because I, I, I couldn't quite figure it out. But I remember like just whispering to myself, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to do it as well as him someday, and I want to do it even better. And I was just so competitive by nature, you know. I just wanted to to see progress, um, and uh, and that was it, you know. I I just I never really gave it second thought, you know. I, it's not something that I chose. It's something that chose me, you know. And uh, and I never really battled. I never really had a conflict with that. It was my my dad, who, you know, as I started to get older, just said, no, you, uh, you're going to get a real job. <laughs> you know? and so, but, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, we, I, I held my ground and, uh, right. and I, stayed, I stayed true to what it was, that, to my vision, you know, that, that I saw was my path. Right, right. It clearly, and I, I always appreciate um, the acknowledgement that it is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> it's definitely... Um, it is definitely a pursuit, something that it's, it's, it's something that you have to do as you explain. So if, if we were to, so we kind of have a little bit of background, I'm going to go back to, to that, but if we were to talk about your work and your practice to someone that knew nothing about it, how would you describe it? Well, I mean, I think the, that's a, that might be a trick question, because when I look at the images behind me, an image starting from right to left of Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North swearing before Congress in 1988, uh, a picture, a fictional rendering of this monumental collapsing boxer um, painted in black and white, and then this giant kitty cat. You know, I'm not even sure I know how to quite <laughs> answer that, that anymore. Um, can, I, can I share the screen? Absolutely. Uh, let's see, why is it not ready? Do I have access? Yes, you should. Hmm. Sorry, it's gonna, no, maybe not. It's gonna make me go through system preferences. Oh, well. No? Oh, no. Does it say? It's okay. Um, Are you sure? Did, let's see. If Veronica is still on. Oh, uh, here we go. Now, now it appears. Okay. Great. Can you see this? Yes. All right. Um, so here's a, an image, you know, of Alex and I in 88. Um, That's great. A, uh, Another image here where, you know, it just, it all seems so natural for me. Uh, I just, you know, so I look at this image and I, it blows my mind how some things never change. Uh, you know, everything from just the intensive, extremely intensive focus and concentration, um, same style of shirts. The only thing is about change is, is the, uh, the head of hair. <laughs> You know, that's about it. <laughs> yeah, some things are out of our control. Can't have it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, if I had to describe, you know, my work, I mean, I think that I, I, uh, I can easily sum it up by saying that, um, you know, I, I really, it's always been my life's effort to, to try to offer this work to you as a report. I want to make a chronicle of this brief moment that's in existence of this time and this place and of what I bear witness to. Um, this work is my testimony. I testify to the things that I, that I witness. I testify to all that I have experienced. This work is framed by my personal experiences and my examination of 21st century America. I think essentially at the end of this life and career, 
I will be able to look back and, and say in all honesty that um, my work, my subjects convey a, a real struggle, a quest for transformation, for love, for conflict, a tale, and a tale of survival in contemporary America. When, you know, as you, all, there's, there is definitely a diversity in terms of, of imagery, but when you talk about this idea of testimony and bearing witness, I often wonder to you, is how important is it to you to have the viewer experience something specific? Do you, do you want them to respond when you say it's, uh, you know, that you're, that you're chronicling it for us? Is there something that you hope that the viewer gets out of it or are you very much removed from that and it's really about what you're putting forward and whatever happens, happens? Because you're so specific about it and I'm just curious how you feel if there is a particular relationship that you're trying to create um, when someone does experience your work. Now, are you seeing the image of uh, the back of my head with the large tattoo guy? Or no? Um, what, what image is showing up? It's still you oh. and Alex. Okay. I'll just leave it on. Um, how okay. about now? Yeah. Now it's the, yeah, now it's the, uh, it's a figure of the head. Okay. So, you know, I think that I can answer that question um, in two ways. I mean, I think for me, I, yes, uh, I think not only my, my um, uh, quest for, my desire for engagement with the viewer, you know, is, is real. That's what most artists are, that's what all artists are, are trying to achieve, right? A call and response between the work and the audience. Um, but I think that I, the only thing that, um, I request, um, the only thing that I desire from a viewer is to really feel um, something, you know, I think that to have a, a, a um, I, I, I want to um, share that, uh, that moment of, of what I encounter when I'm creating, when I'm so, enveloped in these worlds, right, that I'm creating. Um, when I make this work, um, I not only live this work, but I, I am this work. And so I, every part of this image that you see on the screen, you know, is, is, exists for me daily, right, while I'm creating it. Uh, I exist inside of those nostrils, in between the, the bristles of hair on the mustache and the goatee in the world of that eye socket, right? I can crawl into that ear. I can feel it through the color, through the light and the contrast. I can feel it in terms of a range of emotions. And it is my way of offering that same kind of uh, relevatory experience for the viewer. I think essentially for me, it's my way of in the 21st century countering um, the notion of numbness, right? That we all, that, that plagues us all as a society, right? Especially in American society. Um, and I think it really comes back to, goes back to this one uh, experience for me at about that same age, age nine or 10. It was a really important uh, moment in my life because it, uh, you know, I think I, was on a different, somewhat of a different wavelength from most nine and 10 year olds. And, and, and I think it had some very positive and also negative effects, you know? And I, I remember sitting in a movie theater watching Oliver Stone's Platoon. Actually, this is 1987. And I remember my mother um, looking at me and my siblings and saying, if something is too terrifying, cover your eyes, you don't have to look. And I remember my first immediate thought was, are you kidding me? My eyes were wide open, like what could be so crazy that she doesn't want me to stare at this? And, uh, 
And, and, and for those that have seen the movie, it's an amazingly powerful film about the Viet young men at war in the Vietnam War, the atrocities and the injustice of war from many different sides and angles. But what really moved me most, I was captivated by the eerie dead silence in a packed movie theater, 150 people. You could have, I could have heard somebody breathing from across the theater, it was so silent. And my eyes and my, 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 um, my mind was completely entranced, not only by the screen, but I remember looking around at the audience and it all just sort of clicked for me and I thought, this is it. That's what I wanna do. This idea of the call and response between image and viewer, that an image could be so captivatingly powerful and moving that it could keep 150 people in dead silence. I, I knew there's something to it. How do I do that? Um, and I think that, that for me, that's the power of imagery right in all of our history in advertising that can that's the power of imagery when that can be used in both positive and negative forces right um and uh and so these images for me are a simple offering of gift to um fellow humans um i want these i want to um offer a moment of silence uh, and a moment of clarity in times of immense distortion and chaos. That's it. That in itself to me is a revolutionary act, right? Because look around us, right? Uh, the noise, and the chaos, and the mirages of images, flash images that come and go and disappear by the second, by the milliseconds, right? If it didn't happen this morning in America, it never happened because that's how fast uh, we become an amnesiatic, we are conditioned to be, uh, and to exist as amnesiatic um, thinkers, right? And so um, I'm not too concerned whether viewers agree or disagree with the subject matter, that's out of my control, right? That's not my interest. What's important is that I, cap I captured your attention for more than two seconds, for just a single moment, right? For me, that's everything. That's all I can ask for. So it's I, I, as you were as you were talking, um, things started to come together for me as I as you as you described the experience in a movie theater, with being captivated by a large screen and what was going on, and then you talked about your background working in murals, and then the scale of your work, I'm kind of starting to think how, yes, and then the multi-paneled images that you are creating um, your rendition of <laughs> a short film, you know, to some degree, but it's, but it's also, I realized that, and I, again, because we had the fortune of talking about the city, that it is very much about slowing down to actually absorb and reflect. You are creating moments for us to reflect, but the, also the idea of this um, jolting us out of this numbness, clearly your work does that. But as you, as you described it, it kind of all came together. Um, does that, and, and so I'm curious, so from working with Alex at such a young age and murals, how, how did this all, how, how is, this journey evolved for you to where you are now. Can you tell us a little bit about the mural and your work with that and how that has brought you here? And I'm curious influences um, that have uh, attributed to, to because usually my question now is what are you working on now? But I'm really more, I'm more into the process and the journey of how we got here. So, you know, the, uh, the cinematic quality, right? The structure of an image through a cinematic scope. For me, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, there is such a cinematic quality to this work that, uh, that I never abandoned because that was my first uh, formal art training. That's how I see it. I used to uh, get my mom to pause the VHS, the VCR, 
and then I'd run to the TV screen with a sheet of tracing paper and I would trace and that's how I learned anatomy. That's how I learned. And so not only am I learning anatomy, but think about a movie scene, right? A sequence, the sequential series that I create, that's a movie unfolding, right? It's a narrative, but facial expressions on actors, right? I couldn't have asked for a more better guide in terms of learning the human body, right? The human body as form and as experience and as expression. And so by the time that I started working on murals with Alex, well, I had taken, I had brought with me, you know, in those um, sh few short years, this, this influence from the screen. And then I started painting these murals and it just blew another door wide open by age 10, age 12, age 13, because here I am sitting under the hot Texas sun every day after school, on the weekends, on holidays, um, and I'm sitting on scaffolding with Alex in the housing projects of San Antonio, right? These, these uh, Mexican-American Chicano communities, um, working class, if not um, in, in poverty, right? And it really showed me a whole other world that wasn't uh, as familiar to me. You know, I would go, grew up in the, a working class neighborhood, Chicano neighborhood, but the housing projects and my South Side neighborhood were divided by train tracks as many communities are in America. And on the other side of those tracks was an entirely different world, right? And I saw there's two different realities going on in America, right? Two very different worlds and existence um, that exist in tangent with each other, but couldn't be more different from each other. But as I began to know these people in the, these communities, right, um, I saw the pride they were taking in the work that me and Alex were creating. And then it all dawned on me. Of course, they recognize themselves. They recognize, they see their own stories in these pictures that we are creating. And they are protective of us and they are protective of these images and they are these images, these murals are a, uh, the continuation of a long extensive legacy of Chicano murals in the United States, particularly in the Southwest. And I thought that's it. There was no turning back, right? This was what I was going to do with the rest of my life if I could help it. I was going to make work about people to serve people, right? People's stories that weren't being told Right? Because it, was, it couldn't have been more clear to me that there were worlds within America that were being left behind, that were being completely denied, that were being um, uh, negotiated, that were being erased, that were being stamped out forever. Right? And so uh, there, was, there really was no turning back. I couldn't have asked for a... You know, I'm so great, I will forever be grateful to my parents who, I mean, what parent allows their 10 year old child to go into these housing projects, right? With a stranger who's 19 years old and says, I'll be back when the sun's setting to pick you up, right? But they saw in me and they saw in Alex that there was just something, a connection, you know? And so I remember Alex, you, you know, would tell me at age 10, he was like, I've known you before, or we've known each other in other lifetimes, you know? We just happened to be meeting up again and uh, in this one. And, um, and so we really were like Batman and Robin, you know, we just, we would finish a mural. Um, I mean, in 1989, I think about some of the subjects that we were depicting. We were, one of the, one of the that comes to mind is a, a giant three-story mural in, in one of the, in the Mirasol housing projects that was about AIDS, the AIDS epidemic in the heterosexual community, particularly in the brown community. It was completely taboo. I mean, AIDS itself as a subject was in 89, 88, during the Reagan era, was already a taboo, unspoken subject, ignored, denied, right, neglected. Um, but to talk about it in the Latino community, to talk about it in the straight community, that was just, and, and uh, I'll never forget going to school that following year uh, after that summer. And mine and Alex's mural were printed by the San Antonio Independent School District um, on every book cover 
of every grade of every public school in that city. For that to happen, I mean, I feel so fortunate to have caught the tail end of the old world as I see it. That would never fly nowadays because it was a very graphic mural. There was a Grim Reaper. There was a, in the center of it was a, a family, a Mexican American family with the children. Um, we had um, Tecatos, which are uh, Chicano slang for heroin users shooting up the needles flying around the family, um, you know, the uh, prostitution, right? Uh, I mean, that would never fly, but, but to have this, the opportunity to use an image as a resource for information and for education, that's, that's why I'm so drawn to the artists from the WPA movement in America. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and, and so, yeah, by the time I got to RISD, you know, I just, uh, I was really <laughs> on my own, on my own path. And uh, I, uh, you know, it, um, it really was a way of just making sure that I was allowed to bring my own stories and experiences and share them with an audience like at RISD. And that there was not only one way of looking at art, um, th which is, you know, through a Eurocentric lens, you know, and so, but the, again, the world, even in 2000, in 1999, in academia was entirely different from what we're seeing now in the art world and in, in the institutional world. Uh, you know, there were professors that flat out told me, you cannot do this stuff. No, 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 this is not going to fly here. We don't care about this, right? Why should we? And, uh, you know, I just, um, I never let that stand as an obstacle in front of me. I just, it really would light such a fire under my ass that I, I would get so enraged, not with fury, but with anxiety and with persistence and say, I will show you and I will prove you wrong because you're saying, no, I will. Um, and, uh, and I'm still trying to prove them wrong. You know? <laughs> well, we support your efforts. You've definitely created. I really appreciate you sharing that part of the story because I think that's a common experience for a lot of our young artists who go to school, especially those from marginalized groups who don't have that legacy that we are trying to illuminate. We don't need to create it, but what you've brought up is the point um, and unfortunately, that's a huge soapbox for me. I wish it didn't have to be, but it's a myth of absence that we haven't always been here and that to see those images are empowering, um, but not necessarily um, acknowledged or rather somewhat peripheral in, in academia sometimes. And so it can definitely deter our young artists. But I think what you've said is that to persevere is the hardest, but it sometimes I think can break folks down instead of um, motivate and that's sure. a hard one. You know, I, I think if I had to um, say in one way that the work has definitely changed, progressed since my days at RISD or since the mural days is that, uh, you know, it's been, it's been a long uh, journey over the past 20 years as a career trying to find ways to keep pushing my own boundaries in terms of um, widening my arc, right? And so what I mean by that is by finding ways of saying, not only do I bring a Mexican American experience, not only do I bring um, uh, the experience from, of growing up in South Texas or from the, in the American Southwest, not only do I bring the experience of, um, you know, of a young Chicano um, a figurative painter, somebody who paints in kind of what's considered an old school fashion in terms of skill and craft. I just need this arc, you know, this imaginary arc to just go further and further and umbrella more and, and umbrella a wider audience, right? And so I've never viewed this work as solely just um, from the viewpoint, the vantage point of being a Chicano artist. Um, you know, it's, it's this being a Chicano artist means um, to me is as equivalent as being an American artist, right? And so uh, one of the, one of the, the big uh, challenges that I discovered very early on once I was out of RISD was that 
with institutions, with curators, with critics, with writers, with academics. Immediately, it was my skin color, right? My, my ethnicity that was being the, was the focal point, right? It was, it was rarely ever the work, right? And so it's just been, it will always be an uphill battle for me. You know, I'm convinced that, um, that uh, not always will um, white America um, view this work the, in the same, in a similar fashion that, that I see it in the studio. <clears throat> you know, this, this work is, is the American experience, right? And the American experience to me is a giant pot of chili, right? With all kinds of different flavors thrown into it. Um, and so that I think is, is what I'm trying to execute, what I'm trying to convey in this wide range of imagery, palettes, subject matter, technique, scale, sequences, timelines, right? It's, it's my goal that someday in the future, when I'm not around, that this is what becomes most evident, right? That there was, that I had such a wide periscope, always as the observer, right? That I wasn't my side of San Antonio, right? It's as relevant as a series of drawings of presidents. I want, it's my hopes that these images, this wide range of images will be an aid to further help others connect the dots. Look around you, listen, right? Pay attention. Be skeptical of what you think you already know. Always be skeptical of what you think you see, right? When I, when I glance through this range of this trajectory of images, each one is a dot in a constellation, right? One is not more relevant than the other. They all are speaking to each other. Right? There's a conversation happening that I feel that I really think that in some ways, you know, I've had to come to terms with this, the, the conversation that I'm having with these images in the studio is probably premature, right? I, I don't think that it's a conversation that I'm encountering outside in the world, right? Um, I mean, the way I see it is America's barely willing to even um, speak, you know, at this moment in time. Um, and, um, and so this is where I um, try to um, hide out in the studio and, and just have that conversa conversation with myself, you know, and figure out ways in which I can get others to, to just um, take a moment and think critically and, and wonder about something that they've seen, something that they've, that's been presented. Uh, and and to, to, offer, to give them enough curiosities to pick up a book, right? So, I mean, there's so many um, different artifacts that, that supply uh, like a fuel line, um, the inspiration behind this work, whether it's from historic music, the literature, um, art movements, art history, um, cinema, um, social movements, um, and, uh, and, and I really see, I really view these, each one of these images as codexes, right? Um, I really, really need to make it a point to sit down one day and write extensively about almost everything that I've created and, and hide this stuff so that someday when it's found, <clears throat> um, somebody might read it and say, now I see it. Now that makes sense, right? Um, now let me go back and watch this film that, it really gave, inspired Vincent to make this image that you see here. Um, it was just uh, that, that movie scene only lasted 0.2 seconds, but now I see it in an entirely different way. Right? Mm -hmm. There was so significant about these little silent whispers that were larger than life experiences for me. Um, yeah, I think that that's so much, that speaks so much about my own experience in America. Um, there are <clears throat> numerous realities, numerous uh, perceptions, numerous um, ways of, of existing in this country, depending on your background, your um,
you know, it's, but it's really fascinating. Um, you know, as terrifying as it can be, um, is also as powerful, as powerfully beautiful as it is, right? Um, I think this is part of, of the fortune that we all have, um, that we must remember we are fortunate to live at, an, at a moment in time like this. Because as scary as it might be, the, the thing that the logic behind it is that it means that we have a small window of, of trying to reshape it, of, re, of molding it once again for the next generation, right? And so, uh, so yeah, I, uh, you know, this is my one little contribution. This is all I have to offer, but it's something. It's, it's quite a bit. It's quite a bit. Um, there's never enough time. I have so many questions for you. So I'm going to try and get through them in 15 minutes. Let's do this. Okay. The first is I loved you talking about this, this arc because that is so important. You know, you talked about the diversity of experiences, you know, within, especially within, um, especially right now, I will say specifically in the art world. Um, this idea of what is indicative of black art, brown art, art by those within the community, and that it, there is not, there just isn't one, but we are such a society and a culture in which we categorize and need to organize that it, it creates this conflict. So I, this idea of this, this arc, what would you, as you, as you've been in this process, have you felt like you've like you felt like you've had any major success with that, not success in terms of accolades, but you felt like you succeeded in, in something within that process, if within that effort to do that, that you felt like, yes, this is what I was trying to do, or, or this has been for me, a, you know, a personal, a personal success in which my efforts, it, it, it delivered what I thought it could, or it would, or I'm, I'm making, I'm making strides. Hmm. Uh, I mean, I, I'd have to say yes and no. Um, you know, I, I think maybe potentially yes in the ways that um, I've persevered in regards to creating the work and just trying every which way I can to push this work uphill to find other avenues, alternate routes, when the art world said no, I'd find, I'd, you know, a persistent back alley way of, of entering, right? And so, um, and, and maybe the answer is no in regards to, um, do I still feel like this work is a part of the national conversation? No, not even close, right? And so there are still, bigger strides to try to accomplish. Um, but in regards to what is, is occurring recently in, in, in terms of the art world, finally stubbornly opening its doors a little bit more for artists of color. Um, I think that, um, you know, it's, uh, I look more, I acknowledge more some of the artists, my predecessors, like John Maladez, Cesar Martinez, Kathy Vargas, Luis Jimenez, Alex Rubio, who have still yet to be admitted into that art world because now they're the older generation and they're not in this young category anymore, right? And so I, uh, you know, I, I, what I would encourage younger artists uh, of color to um, be wary of is these temporary moments in the art world. Right, um, that um, will will showcase the work, will embrace the work until the next hot um, trend comes along. And so, keep your eyes on the prize in terms of the bigger picture. Right, this is if you're in this, you're in this for the long haul. Um, and uh, and unfortunately, I do think that uh, you know that's it's a, a harsh reality of the art world is that they still don't quite understand that artists of color might have more to remark on other than just social political topics and race, right? Why is it that um, you know, a painter like Ed Ruscha, um, Anselm Kiefer, Jasper Johns gets to address any subject in, a wi in the widest arc of all in terms of subject matter and never gets questioned about it, right? But when it comes to um, 
an artist of color, well, your your lane is race and identity, right? And so I, you know, I just um, that's that's also part of the struggle, and I think that um, we just got to keep pushing forward um, because the uh, world as we know it um, in American society is extremely still ignorant and stubborn, um, and uh, and power is not going to be handed over easily. Um, but you know, I think that it's uh, it's um, it's the responsibility of the artist to challenge notions of power, to challenge um, anything that is um, considered um, problematic in the mainstream. And I think that uh, you know, I I am I sleep better at night knowing that I've spent an entire life and career um, recognizing artists like Peter Saul, Philip Guston. Uh, Kathy Colwitz, because in their lifetimes and careers, when the art world and the world mainstream world was saying, we're going this way, these few individuals said, I'm going this way. And, uh, and that's okay with me. Um, you know, you just gotta, I just gotta keep doing what I'm doing and, uh, and making it um, in the best way that I know how, and that's honesty. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think a lot of times, um, more often than not, people who are outside of the art world or listen to talks um, by artists about their process and their practice, there's been such um, so little attention on the amount of research that goes into the work that artists do. And I think that also what you uh, touched on was the concept of documenting the work, which we have always put in the hands of curators or art historians, but we know that if we are not part of that community, our work won't be documented in the same way. So I'm just wondering um, to you, how, how, much, how much of this requires or do you um, engage in, and that can be, it, you've described so many things, but your, the importance of research and what that looks like for you. The research is a pretty extensive part of developing this work. Um, you know, I have such a wide range of interests, um, even just as hobbies, right, on my own time, um, that I cannot help but feed this into the work. And so I keep a pretty extensive uh, archive uh, and collection, um, whether it's between historic books, um, endless amounts of music, uh, records, um, photographs, uh, of both personal and historical, uh, and and I, uh, you know, for me, this is the um, yeah, this is the fuel behind the fire. I mean, without without these kinds of um, resources, um, the work would be pretty boring. I mean, it's I'd say ninety four percent of all the work that I've ever created is, is um, directly connected, um, is, is inf- inspired by some actual uh, song lyric, right? Um, a, a, one line in a historic text. Uh, and, um, and I think I inherited this um, interest from my mother, who was one of the most amazing archivists that I've ever known. Um, you know, she, under her bed are, are still several shoe boxes. Anybody could go, any museum, <laughs> when you say, I need photos of Vincent from, a, from so and such and such mural, 1987. And she'd say one second and she'd go and she has them all filed. Uh, <laughs> and so I really learned to respect and appreciate that. And it really taught me um, to just build your own uh, collection because it's going to be important someday in terms of decoding the work, right? Um, and so I feel, again, I'm just very lucky that I have all of my very first drawings from age three and four because she kept that extensive archive. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I, I've inherited boxes of super eight millimeter and 35 millimeter films from my grandfather when nobody else wanted them. I took them all. I restored them, had them digitized. Um, and so, so one day I know that, um, you know, I'll find an institution to, to devote all of these, to commit all of these um, uh, resources or 
the archive too, um, because it is not only my story, but it's my family's story, right? It's my community's story. And so, so I always saw it as like this great responsibility. Um, you know, it's never just been about me, but it's about we. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the, the one thing that, um, well, everything that you've said, uh, it really is, it's amazing in, in different ways because, you know, as I said at the beginning, one of the things that we are very committed to is an understanding of what it actually takes to navigate this, but it is not just about um, what, what come, it's not just about the product, it's about the process, but it is also about understanding what you're leaving behind and that that does require a certain amount of um, investment, time, <laughs> management, and it's wonderful that your mother is your registrar, that's, <laughs> incredible uh, but I think that one of the things too that you've um, touched on that is something that we realize is that the work that you are doing often um, and I see I think we see this a lot specifically now when we talk about the times that we're in and all of the writers that we look to you know I, there are so many things that James Baldwin uh, wrote and said and that are <laughs> coming to fruition as we as we live our lives. Um, but one of the things about your work that brings to mind um, a quote is that, you know, he talked in terms of, we cannot change everything, but we, but if we don't face what we need to change, we cannot change it. And what you are doing is making us face those things with what you are creating for us. And that it is not, as specific or it is not just one vision. It is a vision that we all share and we all see, but this numbness that you talked about creates these blinders. And I think that um, everything that you've described, you've dropped a lot of knowledge on us today. Um, and I, I feel as though we're definitely going to look back on everything that you're leaving us and we'll see as as Baldwin has that yeah you're just a little you're a little ahead of our conversation but it is ironically relevant right now in real time um and and I I wonder as you as you reflect on on that right now um you've said it but is that enough motivation for you to just keep going is that what keeps you going well, you know, on on Wednesdays I say it's enough, and then on Thursdays I wake up and say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go be a fisherman in Portugal, uh, live the good life. You know, I, uh, yeah, you know, I, I think for me, uh, I'll share I'll share a, a quick little um, memory with me. Yeah, uh, please. Uh, what makes this all worth it? regardless of the struggles, regardless of the insecurities, the uncertainty, um, the labor that goes into this work, endless labor. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget making the city painting. Um, and I, I didn't let my parents see it. It took me an entire year to the teeth. It was 12 months exactly. I didn't let them see it until the very last stage of that painting. And I walked my mom in and you know, it was a 40 foot painting of this these clan members on a scene in 21st century America. Um, and she walked into the studio and, uh, and, she, and I opened the door and she was confronted by this monumental haunting image. And she just stood there quietly in silence and she was nodding her head and then looked from left and went 40 feet down to the right. And then she just said, yep. And, and I said, well, what do you mean? And then she said, well, what do we expect? Of course, this is America. This has been America as long as I've known it. This has been America as long as my parents have known it, as, as long as my grandparents have known it. Um, what's the big deal about this painting? Because there was already this buzz about it. And I just, I love that. I, I, I really cherish that because I, um, it meant, it represented something so much bigger to me. You know, I've always, you, I've always, um, uh, gauged the world and its reception to my work 
based off of my immediate family and friends in the community that have absolutely nothing to do with the art world. Because to me, they're the real people living and working um, you know, in the communities and in the hearts of cities. And, uh, and, uh, and so I always use that as a reminder, right? Like if, if my mom could see through what I was trying to um, say in this, you know, in this somewhat controversial painting, then it was going to all be okay, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, uh, she didn't have to reassure me and pat me on the back and say, well, you know, just keep going forward. She just, uh, she saw it, right? And uh, um, yeah, I think that if I can continue to use this work to connect to other people about their lives and experiences, it's the same thing that James Baldwin once said. Uh, it's one of my favorite cultural women. He said, um, somebody asked him, what, but what, does, what can reading offer you, right? What can reading the great poets, the great writers of our time and beyond offer you? He said, well, re opening a book is like opening an entirely other existence. Uh, in reality, it's a reminder to us all that we are not alone in the struggle, right? These struggles have always been around, people in conflict, right? But what it can, what it can, what you can learn from it is that human beings will persevere. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they just have to be reminded that um, the human experience is universal, right? Is, in, is uh, enduring um, and possibly never ending. Right, and, and, and that's what this work is to me. It's just, um, I could really, I really am not interested in what the art world has to say about it. It's about what people have to say about it, right? Um, that's it, that's enough. That's, that's all I need, just little, little reminders of that and I'll, I'll, I'll be okay. <laughs> well, I, I agree. You're definitely, you're definitely helping us with that. Um, it, it, as I said, I, I have so many more questions for you. We're going to have to do this again really soon. Um, you know, there is something, certain artists and their work, it goes, you know, it goes beyond what we, what we see at first. And it takes a discussion to go to the next level. But what you do with your work is create a context for that discussion to just continue over and over. And I, I've been witness to it. And so we really appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what's next. I didn't get to ask you that question. Um, but I, I do appreciate what you are doing. And, and you are in and of itself through your work, but also literally paying it forward. Um, and we, we appreciate you doing that work. Um, you have left us a great legacy already, but I'm really looking forward to what you, you do next. So um, I hope we can invite you back for another discussion because we have a lot to finish, I think. You let me know. I have more time on my hands now that Caitlin's helping me get the work done. So, <laughs> uh, and, and for anybody that uh, might have any interest, uh, just yesterday, um, PBS launched as part of their ongoing series, um, American Masters, they launched a, a short film um, that features the work and, and the filmmaker did an amazingly insightful job. It's about a 13 minute film, but, uh, and you can find that, I think if you just type in my name and PBS and it'll take you straight there. The beginning is near is, is the uh, film title. The beginning is near. Well, we're definitely gonna be plugging that. We can't wait to see it. I'm so glad you shared it. Um, please keep sharing what's going on because we love sharing what's going on with you with other folks. But more importantly, we appreciate you sharing your time with us. Thank you so much. It's been awesome talking to you as always. And uh, I'm always, you're always welcome back. Thank you, Vincent. Take good care, stay safe. And again, we're looking forward to talking to you really soon. Best to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Caitlin. <laughs>